Hello everyone and welcome to the next video on the Tal Memorial. As I mentioned in the last video, I was away yesterday so I'm a bit behind in the coverage but I'm hoping to get up to speed quickly. For those of you that were asking, my game in Dublin didn't go too well. I sacrificed a rook unsoundly and it went badly pear-shaped. But to get on with some proper chess anyway, this is one of the two great games from round 6 of the Tal Memorial. Some people were asking to see the lively Kramnik Ponomaryov game, and I will get back to that one in a day or two. It's about 80 moves long, so it's uh, going to take some work. But for now, we're going to look at Morozovic Ivanchuk, which was equally good. Morozovic had the white pieces and opened with d4, after which came knight f6, c4, g6, and f3. And there's been some debate on the chessgames.com page for this game about what exactly this opening is. To begin with, it was listed as a King's Indian, but that later changed to the Alekine variation of the anti Grunfeld in the so called Indian game. This bo move by Morozovic f3 is characteristic of the Simish, vari Simish variation of the King's Indian, but matters were further complicated in a few more moves time after c5 which is the normal mode of progression in Benoni systems for black especially after d5 bishop g7 e4 d6 knight c3 black castling knight g e2 and e6 so what is this opening please leave your comments for now I guess we can call it a Simish Benoni in any case, black is playing in hypermodern fashion and allowing white a strong pawn center with the hope of breaking it down later whilst controlling the center with pawn with pieces in the meantime. The idea with f3 and e4 is not unheard of at top level and almost to be expected from the unorthodox and aggressive Morozovic. One drawback, as in the Simish King's Indian, is that not having a knight on f3 he has less control over the central dark squares, um, which is especially so considering black's bishop on g7. It was a very accurate game from both sides. Fritz had no alternative moves to offer right up to well beyond move 30. Play continued here now with knight g3 and knight a6, which is planning knight c7 and pushing these queenside pawns, which is a fairly common plan in some variations of the King's Indian defense. Then came bishop e2 and e takes d5, which is the last book move of the game. And Morozovic recaptured now with the c-pawn, which creates some nice imbalance in the position with two semi-open files for either side to work with. Ivanchuk continued with his plan, knight c7, and then came a4, which is a multi-purpose move both prophylaxis against black's queenside pawns stopping them from moving too freely and allowing white's pieces to go to b5 with greater security Chucky answered with a6 so it's controlling b5 so white can't use it for his pieces and preparing the pawn move b5 himself and uh, then came bishop g5 from Morozovic pinning the knight at f6 and now bishop d7 which is further preparing b5 and here Morozovic embarked on a similar plan we saw in his game against Kramnik with h4 which is planning to get some activity for his rook on h1 without having to move it and delaying or perhaps abandoning castling is something to be wary for in any opening especially the king's indian defense castling too early and being subject to a brute force attack with your opponent foregoing castling in order to have a dangerous h-file rook. But Ivanchuk deals with it calmly and precisely and continues first of all with his plan on the queen side with b5 and Morozovic pressed further on the king side with h5. And here Ivanchuk thought for a long time and played h6 which is definitely the best move and gains the advantage for black already at move 14 with initiative and better development. Morozovic answered with bishop e3 and now Ivanchuk gained further space on the queen side with b4 and after knight b1 
gain space on the king side with g5. And this approach really is double-edged. Although Ivanchuk is gaining space, he's also creating some weaknesses, but his judgment proved to be excellent, as it almost always is. As you'll see, his play in this game was superb. Morozovic continued with bishop f2, and now Ivanchuk carried out a classic King's Indian maneuver with knight f e8, rook a2, and f5. And rook a2 is a strange looking move from Morozovic, but there's method to his madness. He's taking it out of the firing line of the bishop on g7 here, and now this bishop has brilliant control of this long diagonal. And later, after b3, he's going to swing this rook over to the king's side, where it will where be uh, more active. And interestingly, at this stage of the game, black is already better, with an edge of 0 0.4 pawns, according to Fritz. Ribka's analysis was the same when the game was being played live. And what's remarkable about Ivanchuk's play is that he's able to not only maintain this advantage, which is a difficult task in itself, but also to make it grow and grow until he has a completely winning position. Morozovic now cemented the queen side and prepared to swing his rook over with b3. And then came f takes e4 and knight takes e4. And Ivanchuk now has a stronger pawn center to go with his positional advantage and still a very strong grip on the central dark squares. Play continued with bishop f5 which is now controlling crucial light squares that have been somewhat weakened with these uh, kingside pawn moves. This diagonal slightly weakened and bishop f5 takes control of that. So then came knight g3 and king h8 which is offering Morozovic the bishop pair which must have been tempting considering black's pawn structure and the resulting light square weakness he would have after knight takes f5 with almost all of his pawns on dark squares. But essentially it's a trap that would gain Ivanchuk good initiative and at least a pawn. Let's have a look. If knight takes f5, then rook takes f5, and black has immediate pressure on white's isolated d5 pawn, with a knight f6 coming, say for example, if bishop c4 to defend it, knight f6 and White is definitely losing the pawn as he has no further way to defend it. The casual rook d2 fails to the tactical shot, knight takes h5, and if rook takes h5, queen e8 check is going to win the exchange a pawn and before long the game. So Morozovic didn't go in for that line, and after king h8 from Ivanchuk, he played bishop c4. So now came bishop h7 from Ivanchuk, retreating his bishop, and look at the scope and space his bishops are controlling together, these two beautifully open diagonals. It's quite an incredible sight, and moreover they're doing an important defensive job defending the king, considering these kingside pawn moves that black has made. And he won't move either of these bishops for 15 moves, by which time he has a completely winning position. Morozovic now castled, which brings into question his earlier kingside pawn advance. This pawn's up on h5 now, stranded. And Chucky now got his knight back into the game with knight f6, and Morozovic finally got his offside rook into play with rook e2, taking control of the only fully open file. And sensing the danger of rook f e1 coming, Chucky now took defensive action with queen d7, and after rook f e1 encouraged the exchange of all the rooks with rook a e8. And here black's advantage is bordering on a pawn, and white's only positional asset, control of this e-file, is quickly liquidated now, because in this position it's best for Morozovic to exchange off the rooks. Ivanchuk can basically force it in any case because the pressure on the d5 pawn here means that uh, he can play if Ivanchuk doesn't exchange he can play rook takes e2 and there's no bishop takes e2 because this pawn would be falling. So here it's best for, for Morozovic not to lose time which he would in that continuation and initiate the exchange himself.
which he did with rook takes e8. Then came rook takes e8, rook takes e8 check, and queen takes e8. Okay, I'll have to do this video in a few parts, so that's the end of part one.